Hello, friends. Welcome back to Our Courageous Leadership with Virginia Pradhan, which airs every Wednesday and Saturday at 10 o'clock on Spotify, Podbean, Edify, Apple Podcast, and many other platforms. And of course, you can watch it on the YouTube channel. I am your host, Virginia Pradhan. I'm grateful for you to be here to learn to be trained to live a life of significance and success, to be strong and courageous. We are grateful for many of you supporting our podcast, sending questions, comments, um, all kind of suggestion for you uh, because you are the one who uh, initiate this podcast after many of you read my memoir, Saving My Assassin. It's my memoir of my legal work in socialist Romania and communist Romania to defend uh, human and religious uh, cases under dictator Ceausescu and my life here in America as an ally attorney with Alliance Defender of Freedom and helping you to stand up and be faithful under those circumstances. But our podcast developed even more, and now we love also to invite courageous leaders in their own areas that will share with us how they started, how they continue to do this amazing work to be courageous leader, to invest in people and to do to have a life of significance and success. And one of these very special guests is Jim Mosley. I have to say that his resume is overwhelming. It's uh, his life is a reflection of love for God. Uh, he holds a bachelor degree um, from uh, uh, Humphrey Hemf College in uh, Massachusetts and a master degree in theology from Liberty University. He uh, has learned, earned a PhD in uh, Bible exposition and he after that he name became the bible history man uh, he wrote 25 books he held many many executive positions like world vision fedex uh, ferrari international new post brings in and many more um, he owns now a transportation business has four children and two grandchildren and lives with his wife and two golden retrieves in rural Massachusetts. The bio is even longer and I will let Jim to um, say more about himself, introduce to our, our audience. Thank you so much for coming to our podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, Virginia. You know, I, I was really amazed by your story, Saving My Assassin. I was telling that to my wife uh, on, on, the, on the back porch, and she was so astonished to, to, to hear the dramatic story. And, you know, I have, a, I have a ministry called The Bible History Guy. You can find that at thebiblehistoryguy.com. And I just finished writing a book published by Whip and Stock called um, the, the, the Biographies of Jesus' Apostles, Ambassadors in Chains. And I was struck listening to your story, how much of what you went through in a different way was what the apostles went through. Because I think we, you know, a lot of people don't really know whatever happened to the apostles. But if you remember when uh, Jesus was resurrected and he was, he went fishing with Peter and John on the shore of Galilee, uh, he, 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 he made a comment that Peter was going to die in a way that he didn't want to. People were going to take him where he didn't want to go, and he eventually was crucified upside down by the Emperor Nero. But Peter had to ask the question, well, what about this man, John? <laughs> uh, you know, you see, and, and so the, the rumor went around that John would not, would live forever, but of course that, that wasn't true. That's not what he meant. But what we see is that the apostles actually all died, except for John, uh, they all died as martyrs. Maybe one other uh, didn't didn't die as martyr, but most of them most of them did. And I was reflecting on your story because when you think about it, here you were in a country with an oppressive and and uh, anti Christian, irreligious government, and we have in Romans thirteen, Paul tells us to pray for the government. 
because he says that God has put those people in power. But I think we forget about the fact that there are other parts in the Bible that say differently. So when Peter and John, when the Sanhedrin told them, stop preaching in the name of Jesus, they said, no, you have to judge. Is it better to listen to God or listen to you? And they continued to preach in the name of Jesus and they went to jail for it. Or, for example, Daniel, when Belshazzar, you know, asked him for a favorable prophecy, he said, no, I'm not going to give you a favorable prophecy. And I reject your appointment as an official in your kingdom because tomorrow you are going to die. And, 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 and he did. So what, what the Bible teaches us is, you know, what your story tells us. We should pray for our leaders when they are aligned with God, but we should align with God instead of our leaders if they are not aligned with God. That is so true. We should um, um, make that line in the sand and say, I support you as government if you are a godly one, because I respect God and God put you in control of our security and a few other things. And we support you with our taxes. But when you ask us to uh, to um go against our own God, we're going to remain faithful to God. There is no way out on on that. And uh, we are grateful for that. We are grateful that um, God is is teaching us uh, how to react in this situation. And I believe that one of the reasons why the Lord didn't allow me to be killed by uh, the socialist government is for now to go around the world, not only in America, and show people what God is able to do in one life. I'm under five feet tall. I was 82 pounds in Romania. So there is nothing impressive about me. It's impressive about God in me. And God can do the same thing in uh, each life if we allow uh, God to do that. Well, I think, you know, that that's it's amazing that your story is unbelievable because I didn't know that you were under five feet tall. And I remember you telling me a story about, I guess it was dark in your office and out of the shadows emerges this man who, did I get it right? Six foot ten? <laughs> that's pretty scary with, 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 with a gun and, and, and you witnessed to him and he came to Christ. And, you know, there's something about the testimony of Jesus, which has always provoked violence in its opponents. You look at even the Apostle Paul before he became a Christian, before he, before he met Christ on the Damascus Road. He Not only did he stand by and hold the cloaks of the people who killed Stephen, the first, the first martyr, he approved of it. And he went beyond approving. He went, he says himself, he went throughout Jerusalem pulling people, Christians, pulling them out of their homes, committing them to jail breathing threats of murder against him. And I have a feeling that if he breathed threats of murder, he probably managed to carry out. Maybe he didn't murder them personally, but he probably caused their execution, yeah. which probably explains why Paul later on was always eager to collect money for the poor of Jerusalem, because even though he probably understood God forgave him, he probably never forgave himself <laughs> for those things that he did. That, that might be the case, but I also use many times my story and how God helped me to turn my assassin into a brother in Christ because when he put the gun on my face and I was by myself in a, in my office with a, a 16 feet tall man with a gun on my face and I was under 5 feet tall, 82, there was no way out. I heard the voice of God saying, Share the gospel with him, and I did share the gospel with him. And I don't know if you got to that point, or because later on, after I came to United States of America, and I went to I learned English, and I went to law school in Dallas, Texas, and I opened my law firm. Later on, he came to Dallas, Texas, and uh, he had a case as a client, but I didn't recognize him after so many. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and uh, he uh, at the end he was frustrated, and he put the um, securitate ID in front of me and said, "Virginia, don't you recognize me?" <laughs> and I realized that I was in front of my assassin, and we shared what the God, what God is doing in our lives, and He asked me to let Him 
uh, write a chapter in my book. So today in Saving My Assassin, you will read his chapter in my book. And I use this because I want to encourage people that we do not have enemies. People that don't agree with us are not our enemies. They are just slaves in the evil stand. Evil one is the enemy of God. And because we belong to God, he attacks us. But our job is to share the gospel with them, with those people that don't agree with that. They might be violent. They might be uh, making fun or mock us. But God wants to use us for his glory so he can bring them to Christ. And what you are reading, you're going to read in my book, Saving My Assassin, what God is doing in his life today. It's absolutely amazing. So my encourage to people is don't look at people that um, not don't agree with you because those people are looking for God. Try to understand that Christ died for them and try to let God in you win this all for Christ. And that's an amazing job. There is no higher higher job than this in, in on this earth. I went twice to law school, once in Romania and once here in America. I had um, education in both systems, and I love education. My kids graduated from SMU, the second one from Harvard Law School, and my son from United yeah. States Air Force Academy. I'm not against education, but education that the Holy Spirit Spirit is giving you when you follow Christ. It's absolutely amazing. And don't take people that don't agree with you as your enemies. You are here not to win an argument, but win souls for Christ. Yeah, that's so true. And I think about, you know, when I wrote the book on the apostles, uh, I spent a great deal of time trying to collect all the information in scripture that exists about them because we tend to read the Bible through and kind of miss certain things. But if you're looking for things, you find how rich the Bible is in details. And you think about it that when from the resurrection for the next 300 years, there was no advantage to being a Christian. You know, people think like Dan Brown, who wrote the, uh, the Da Vinci Code, he thinks that um, the apostles tried to create a, um, a dynasty, tried to create their own, you know, elite group. There was no elite group. They, they were suffering all kinds of persecution. I mean, for example, I'm reminded of your story when I think of how Andrew died. Andrew was in Greece and the proconsul, the Roman proconsul in Greece was um, angry at him because Maximila, his wife, became a Christian. And so he told, you know, Andrew, take it back. Worship the pagan gods or I will execute you. And, and Andrew said, well, you're probably going to have to execute me because I'm not going to do that. So he actually put him on a sideways cross, not a cross like this, a cross like that. And the reason he put him on a cross like that was because he wanted the wild dogs to have a chance to reach his body and tear him alive as he hung on that cross. Well, they, he didn't nail him to the cross like he did Jesus. He tied him. So he was there for two days on that cross, but he was preaching all the time that he was on the cross. Well, what happened is 20,000 people came and came to Christ, listening to him even on, on, on his cross. So we see that, you know, suffering, uh, really God uses that as an amazing evangelistic opportunity. Exactly, exactly. And we don't like discomfort. We don't like, we believe that this, this life should be uh, full of happiness. But Christ told us in this world, you will encounter troubles. But be a good cheer, I overcame the world. And so he told us from the beginning. But when we suffer and we remain faithful, so many people are attracted by Christ in us because they finally see that there is a Christ, a real person. They, they that they cannot see it, but we we worship Him, we follow Him, and we are ready to die for Him. So for us right now in America, and maybe some people think that. It's crazy what I'm going to say it, but trust me, I'm talking about my own experience. When 
things are going wrong and the government goes against us, darkness surrounds us, the Christ, Christ lights in us will shine so brightly that so many people finally will be able to see real Christ, not religion, not, not uh, habits or anything else, but Christ, and they will accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's an amazing, oh, yeah. it's an amazing opportunity that we have. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's, 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 it's amazing how, how the example travels across time and time and space and things like that. I remember there's an early church father who wrote about how when Jesus was uh, in, alive during his earthly ministry, the king of Armenia wrote him a letter and said, it's a disgrace how the Jews are treating you. And if it weren't for the Romans standing between me and you, I would send an army to punish the Jews for treating you in that way. But um, if you like, I would invite you to come to my country because we would like to receive your message, even if your people won't. Now, apparently, Jesus wrote a letter back to him. And it may be the only letter that Jesus wrote. And we don't know for sure if this happened because it was an early church writing. But the message of the letter was, I am not coming because I was sent to the children of Israel. But when I, when my ministry is over, I will send my followers to you. And he sent Bartholomew and Thaddeus, who brought Christianity to Armenia. And then Armenia became, before the Roman Empire did, the first nation in history to adopt Christianity as its natural religion, as its national re religion. So you can see now here, Jesus is suffering at the hands of the Jews. That the knowledge of what he went through traveled all the way to Armenia, and it created that interest, which brought the light of Christ to that country, which has been the oldest Christian nation ever since then. It's a, a totally different concept that we have today in our culture. The government, uh, people that hate the Bible and hate Christian, they are teaching even our children that life should be full of happiness, full of not um, um, telling me the truth, the real truth. Let me choose my truth. Let me do whatever I want. In fact, what they said, I want to be my own God and I want to do whatever it takes to, to do this. And uh, many times I am wondering, I know several of uh, um, private schools here in Dallas and in several other other states are using my, uh, my uh, memoir, Saving My Assassin, as a part of curriculum. I'm wondering if uh, your book or you think about your book giving us uh, a resource for those uh, those Christians because uh, Christian schools because it's important for our children to see that yes there is suffering but there is a reward life here is short and we will live forever with Christ those people they were martyred Yes, may he he suffered for a few days on that cross, but the minute that he died, he went up to heaven. That's what the Bible tells us. And he is at the right hands of Christ, and he reigns there. That's what the martyr's uh, position is. So it's nothing. We don't lose anything when we are faithful to Christ. Well, I think that's right. And the, the point of my book, the reason that I wrote my book the way that I did is it, it tells the stories of the apostles. It tells what their world was like, it tells what their relationships were with each other. A lot of people don't know that uh, some of the apostles like James and John were the cousins of Jesus. So these were not completely strange people. When I used to read and I first became a Christian, how uh, Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. I had the picture that, oh, this stranger shows up on the shores of Lake Galilee and says, follow me. And they drop their nets and follow him. No, they weren't strangers. They were cousins. James and John were cousins. Peter and Andrew were the business partners of James and John. They grew up in Galilee together as little kids. Galilee is a small place. It was not possible for them not to know each other. So there, there are these relationships. But the way that I wrote it is I wanted to tell the stories of the apostles so we could relate to them. We could figure out, you know, what, what were they like? Well, it's not like many people think that they were poor and they were uneducated. They weren't. James and John had a fishing fleet. 
not just one boat, their father, and they had servants to run their business. Peter and Andrew were partners of them. Matthew was a tax collector. He was obviously rich. So these people were rich and they were literally, people always say, well, they were uneducated. But the only reason they say that is because that's what the Jewish leaders said about them, trying to insult them. But they wrote the best-selling books of all time. How do you get to be illiterate and do that? You know, yes, of course, the Holy Spirit guided them, but they had God chose them because they had those talents. So they did those things. And I did a lot of meticulous research in this book. So the book contains a lot of citations, a lot of scripture references, a lot of extra biblical references. But one of the things in answer to your question that, I, that I'm planning to do is take the stories and simplify them. Make them very simple so that they can be understood by children, uh, you know, a much wider audience. If I hadn't written the book the way I did, I couldn't simplify it because you can't start with a simple explanation and then prove everything you say. So when I say things like, you know, uh, Matthew was very probably the brother of Simon the Zealot. And you say, well, where do you get that? Well, now you can go to my scholarly book and I'll show how that can be demonstrated. But now I can simply say that in a much simpler form and try to help people understand, you know, what was it like being a tax collector, right? Somebody who is um, working with the Roman government and having a brother who's a zealot who wants to overthrow the Roman government and both of you end up on Jesus' team. And he manages to reconcile both. Yes, that is so true. I read somewhere, and I believe I'm right, that at one point in your life, you are not a believer. Oh, I was not. I was, from the time that I was 12 years old, I believed that there had to be a God. I thought that was absolutely logical. So I don't, I don't understand atheists. I think that they aren't thinking logically, right? But I was anti-Christian. I thought that Christianity was a bundle of myths that were orally transmitted. I didn't. I thought they were kind of silly and ridiculous. I thought I'd never be stupid enough to be a Christian. Well, what happened is I I achieved a lot of education, and when I finally, I, I I tried to become a Muslim. I studied the Quran. I went all over the world. I went to India. I explored every kind of of of, of religion, traveling everywhere all over the world to do that. But the problem was in every religion, it was like picking up a telephone, hoping to find God. Not only was there no voice on the other end of the telephone, there wasn't even a dial tone. So in, in frustration, I finally came back to the United States. My sister in, uh, suggested I go to a church. Well, I didn't really want to. I went to a church and I heard an altar call. And to be honest, I was not really very impressed. But I thought to myself, well, if I could travel across the Himalayas and meet the Dalai Lama, or if I could trek through jungles in Java to a Sufi shrine, I can walk to the front of this room to the altar and find out if I can meet God. So I went to the front and I prayed the prayer, sinner's prayer, and suddenly a light came on in my heart and I thought, well, that's probably just the atmosphere. But the light didn't go off. And then I realized I have a problem. My heart has become a Christian. But my head hasn't yet. So I began to try to figure out who was right, my heart or my head. And I began to try to take the Bible apart. And I found out I was never able to do it. I was never able to find a problem or a contradiction or a flaw in the Bible. And I realized to my shame that all that time of my life, I was arrogant and wrong. And the Bible was the inerrant truth. I hope that uh, people realize that there is nothing wrong, you know, to question God, nothing wrong to uh, find your way and uh, because God is waiting for you. God is going to answer. And I hope those uh, people that are still looking for God, they will have the opportunity to um, to search like, like you did because Look what God has accomplished in your life in so, so many ways and in, in so many opportunities. And we are so grateful for that. Before we, uh, we um, uh, close, would you tell our audience where they can find you and your books? 
Sure. If you everything is on my website, which is the Bible History So it's pretty simple. The Bible History I have a radio show. You can listen to broadcasts on that website. You can see all my books. I've written 18 books on biblical theology. You can see that on the website. And I have a blog where what I try to do on that blog is so many people ask me questions about the Bible where they just like you said, they're skeptical. And that's great because one of my little mottos on my website is faith is the daughter of doubt. You are never going to get to faith if you don't get there through doubt. You doubt and you look for answers and then you find faith. And so you can find me there in all my books and all my materials. And you can email me through that site. Thank you so very much, Jim, for coming to our podcast. We love all the values and everything, ideas that you share. And I hope that people will go to your website, will um, um, see your books, will buy your books, and being even more involved in blogging and uh, your podcast and uh, so forth. Thank you, Virginia. It's such a pleasure to be with you. And I really admire everything about your story. It's been a great inspiration reading it. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Appreciate that so much. Thank you so very much, everyone, for returning to our podcast, Courageous Leadership with Virginia Prodan. You can go to our website, virginiaprodanbooks.com, and you can find place to contact us, to support our podcast, to ask questions, to be a a person that we would love to interview on our podcast. And most of all, I hope that you will go to Jean's um, um, website. And even if you have doubts, even if you don't know if you want to believe in God or not, today might be the day. So until next time, when we will be together, we hope that this podcast will encourage you, equip you to be strong and courageous and to live a life of significance and success, the kind of life that God intended for you. Until next time, God bless you. Bye-bye.